As global elites continue to reel from the election of right-wing libertarian Javier Millet in Argentina, pundits are racking their brains over how it happened. How did Millet do it? What differentiates the election in Argentina from elections in, say, Brazil or the United States or anywhere in between? Was it Millet's stance on social issues? Was it Argentina's presently soaring inflation? Was it his blunt talk? Was it his funny hair? I've got a simpler answer. Two words. Paper ballots. Last month, the Buenos Aires Herald reported that city residents would be required to vote on paper ballots after electronic voting machines caused all sorts of chaos and confusion in the primaries, leading to a federal judge striking them down and returning to voters the right to elect candidates the old-fashioned way. What's the argument for electronic voting? The only argument is that it makes the process faster and more efficient, except it doesn't because the machines break and then the pipes burst and then vote counting takes days and weeks even, especially when the vote count starts to look bad for liberals. Paper ballots gave Argentinians their answer on election day. It was an answer that the liberal elites don't like. It was an answer that the Argentinian people might not have gotten had computers allowed the count to drag on behind an opaque electronic veil of secrecy. The only advantage that electronic voting has over paper ballots is that it makes it much, much easier for bad actors to steal elections. Argentina was right to get rid of it. American conservatives better take note if we want that result down south to herald good things for us next year. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. This episode is brought to you by GenuCell Skincare. Go to GenuCell.com slash Knowles to get an incredible holiday discount on their most popular package. Also, quick reminder that the best deal of the year is here. 50% off all new Daily Wire Plus annual memberships. DailyWire.com slash subscribe right now to join. Gavin Newsom, potentially the Democrat presidential nominee, currently the governor of California, doing his best Patrick Bateman impression every day. He just accidentally admitted that LGBT activism is obscene. We'll get to that in just a moment. First, though, the man who currently has the job, Joe Biden, is losing a lot of support. His numbers are absolutely in the in the doldrums. He seemed to endorse Gavin Newsom for president the other day. He said, this guy is really good. He could do anything. He could even have the job I'm running for. Ha, ha, ha. And a lot of Democrats, I think, were listening to that and saying, yes, he's certainly good, Joe. You're right. But it's worth remembering, even as everyone appears to abandon Joe Biden, that he does still have one really prominent endorsement, and that is the endorsement of Osama bin Laden. People forget this because Osama bin Laden's endorsement of Joe Biden came from a letter that was discovered after the raid on bin Laden's compound in Pakistan in Abbottabad. Uh, But in that letter, uh, Osama said that groups, the jihadi groups, will remain on the lookout for Obama or Petraeus, the American general and director of the CIA. The reason for concentrating on them is that Obama is the head of infidelity and killing him automatically will make Biden take over the presidency for the remainder of the term as it is the norm over there. Biden is totally unprepared for that post, which will lead the U.S. into a crisis. As for Petraeus, he is the man of the hour in this last year of the war and killing him would alter the war's path. So please ask Brother Ilias to send to me the steps he has taken into that work. Okay. I think the letter is real. I think the endorsement is real. And I think Osama bin Laden's point about Joe Biden is absolutely correct. And I think that point was proven right over the past few years of Biden's presidency. Bin Laden, very evil man, had lots of crazy ideas floating around his head, but even a stopped clock is right twice a day. And he was right about Biden. Joe Biden's presidency has led America into crisis. 
three years ago, we had peace in the Middle East. We had a flourishing economy before COVID. We had uh, our allies around the world stepping up to the plate, actually paying for some of their own defense. We had trade deals being renegotiated. We had, at least for a time, immigration declining, illegal immigration declining, until the deep state gummied up the works and and uh, hindered Donald Trump from from diminishing that. Things were pretty good. Things were pretty good, remember? And then Joe Biden took over, and it's amazing how quickly things can fall to pot. Proving Osama bin Laden's prediction correct, which might actually help Joe Biden here, because don't forget, Zoomers are flocking to bin Laden on TikTok. They've discovered Osama bin Laden's letter to America, and they, they're discovering this as, as though for the first time and saying, oh, wow, Osama was totally right. And we covered it on the show a few days ago. So who knows? Maybe this is all, maybe the, the Osama endorsement was actually leaked by the Biden campaign to win him support among the Zoomers. That would be 5D. That would be, I think, 9 or 10D chess, which, because I agree that Biden is a complete train wreck. He probably is not capable of playing. But who knows? That might be the effect of it. Now, speaking of attacks on Joe Biden, I I have to sort of defend him a little bit. Joe Biden went viral yesterday again for supposedly making weird, creepy comments to a little girl. Here it is. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I love your ears. I love them. They're really cool. What's your name? Catherine. Catherine, what a beautiful name. That's my mommy's name. Well, nice to see. How old are you? 17? Six. Six. (laughs) Okay. So the way this is being reported and going viral is Joe Biden compliments a six-year-old's body, and then he creepily asks if she's 17 and he's a big creep. And he is kind of creepy. I'm not denying that at all. He's got the weird thing about sniffing girls' hair, and there's the weird stuff in the Ashley Biden diary, and it's he's, a, he's weird. He's a weird. I'm not denying that. But this video is not an example of that creepiness. It's an example of another character flaw with Joe Biden, but I don't think he's leching on this little girl. When he's complimenting her ears, I don't think that's him, you know, objectifying her. And, and when he's asking if she's 17, I don't think he's trying to take her out on a date. The, the character flaw that this reveals about Joe Biden is not his lasciviousness. It's his absolute oily, glad-handing, simpering, backslapping politician, empty-suitedness. That's what it is. Joe Biden has no answer on any issues. I don't think he has any particular convictions on any political issues either. But what he's really good at is backslapping people and joking around, and making, making them feel like he's good old Uncle Joe. So what he's doing here, he's putting on a show for the other people in the room. It's not like he's having a private moment with this little girl. He's putting on a show for all these adults in the room. Hey there, little girl, you're, you're so nice looking. Hey there, how old are you? 17? <laughs> nah, I'm just joking. Anyway, <laughs> it's, it's like when a politician kisses babies. That's what this is. For, and for Joe Biden, who's 700 years old now, you know, if you're under 40, you're a baby to him. So it's what it is, and it's his best shot at getting elected. If Joe Biden has ever been elected president, it will be, it will have been because he is really good at backslapping and simpering. And that, that's what's going on here. The hair stuff is weird, but I just think it's a distinct issue. And I want to be fair, okay? I don't want to just be a total hack all the time. I want to defend Joe Biden so that I can criticize him further. Speaking of sexual impropriety, Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, just accidentally said that LGBT behavior is obscene. He tweeted out, this was a few days ago, he tweeted out this article from the New Republic, and he said, a city in Tennessee has banned being gay in public. This is just the beginning. We have to call this out. Did the, Wow, a city in Tennessee banned being gay in public? What's that? I looked, and the city is right near me. It's Murfreesboro. They banned being gay in public, whatever that means? Well, Hold on. What did they actually ban? I looked in. I pulled up the article. The city passed an ordinance back in June. Newsom's just tweeting about it now in November. Back in June, they tweeted out, or they they passed an ordinance banning indecent behavior, including indecent exposure, 
public indecency, lewd behavior, nudity, or sexual conduct. In other words, the governor of California has just equated being gay with indecent and obscene behavior. (laughs) Oopsie daisy. (laughs) Gavin Newsom has just made the argument that the most staunch right-wing social conservatives have been making for a long time. What the libs have tried to argue is, no, this kind of behavior in public is not obscene. No, the pride parades, they're totally family friendly. No, the drag queen story hour, it's just nice fellas wearing silly costumes, just innocently reading books to little kids. The conservatives have said, nah, man, the pride parades are and they belong, if anywhere, they belong they certainly don't belong on Main Street. And, and the Drag Queen Story Hour stuff, it's a bunch of <laughs> who just get a kick out of <laughs> That's really what it's about. And it's <laughs> And Gavin Newsom, the Democrat, just came out and he's like, hey, those conservatives, they're totally right. Oops, that's what we call a Freudian slip, where, of course, uh, one says one thing but means one's mother. Now, when you want to hire people for jobs that are better at them than, say, uh, the governor of California, you got to check out ZipRecruiter. Right now, go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Knowles. With Thanksgiving just a few days away, I wanted to show some gratitude to some of the people on my team. To Mr. Davies and Professor Jacob for producing our show. To Danny, producer Danny, for editing the show. To the great famous Tessa for keeping me on top of everything I have to do every day. It takes a team of amazing people to make this show successful just like it takes an amazing team to make any business successful. If you're hiring, you need to find the best people for your team. You need ZipRecruiter. Right now, you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S. ZipRecruiter uses smart technology to scan thousands of resumes to find the most qualified people for your job. ZipRecruiter lets the most qualified people know that they are a great match and encourages them to apply. ZipRecruiter is trusted by millions. In fact, over 3.8 million businesses have come to ZipRecruiter for their hiring needs. See for yourself why so many business owners are hiring based on ZipRecruiter. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. I would be very grateful if you would go to this exclusive web address to try ZipRecruiter for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash Knowles. ZipRecruiter.com slash K-N-W-L-E-S. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Speaking of undermining the liberal narrative, there's a story, I bet you've seen it going around, that Israel, the state of Israel, has arrested an NBC journalist for expressing public support of Hamas and the Palestine liberation movement. And what you're going to hear from the liberal defenders of the state of Israel is that this is not true. Israel has not arrested a journalist. This is, it's totally different. This person is, for some whatever reason, this person's not a real journalist and they were siding with the terrorists and that's why we arrested them. And it's not arresting journalists. But that's not true. The state of Israel arrested a journalist. This person, not like, you know, it wasn't Walter Cronkite, but this person was a freelancer working for NBC. I think it's totally defensible, but it's not defensible from a liberal perspective. It's only defensible from a conservative perspective. It's only defensible from the perspective that there's no such thing as totally neutral balanced journalism without any political partisan leaning whatsoever. It's only defensible if you reject the liberal notion that we just need total, absolute free speech at all times, everywhere, with no standards whatsoever, man. And we can never in any way have standards or, or norms of decency, man. It's, it's only defensible if you adopt the view that I adopted in my book, Speechless, Controlling Words, Controlling Minds, which at the time, hello, where's my bell? Where's my bell, guys? Good grief. I don't, they're already on vacation for Thanksgiving. At the time I wrote that book, which now was, what, two years ago? A lot of conservatives were embracing the liberal view that that journalists are the esteemed fourth estate and they are above reproach and the journalist, we have to defend the journalists at all costs and we need total free speech at all. No, we, we need, we need proper speech protections in line with the American tradition in line with the best practices of our civilization. But we can't 
pretend that societies are not entitled to any standards whatsoever. We can't pretend that we don't, we're not allowed to have uh, standards against indecent behavior and obscenity. That's the point we were just making with Gavin Newsom. In this case, the state of Israel sees this freelance journalist promoting Hamas, Israel's sworn enemy against which Israel is currently conducting a war, And they're saying, oh, yeah, we're not going to allow the propagandists for our enemy terrorists who are killing civilians and who currently have hostages in Gaza. We're not going to let this propagandist just go about spreading wartime propaganda. We're going to arrest this person. And then NBC fired the person. And now there's one less propagandist on the street. But I think that's totally defensible. If I were in the Israeli government, that's exactly the sort of thing I would do. They're at war. It's an existential war, as they describe it. It's, a, it's another war of independence. But don't, don't look at me and tell me that the facts are not what they are. Don't try to save the liberal narrative, as many on the center left and even on the center right are trying to do right now. No, we're admitting here. There's no such thing as totally neutral journalism. We're admitting that the distinction between journalism and propaganda is a little bit blurry sometimes. We're admitting that societies have the right to standards and norms. We're admitting that at times of war, particularly existential war, some of those civil liberties that we all enjoy sometimes get a little bit curtailed because if they were not to be a little bit curtailed, then you would lose the totality of those civil rights protections. Don't, liberals, don't urinate on my leg and tell me that it's raining. This This is a great teachable moment for the realities of speech in society. And it's a great opportunity to go get Speechless, Controlling Words, Controlling Minds, available now wherever fine books are sold. Number one national bestseller. Thank you very much. Now, I want to go back to Newsom. We took a little break from Newsom to go to Hamas. Now we're going to go back to Newsom. Gavin Newsom is running TV ads. Gavin Newsom, who's totally not running for president. Remember, he supports Joe Biden. He's not running, but he is running TV ads against Ron DeSantis ahead of the Newsom-DeSantis totally not presidential debate. Wanted by order of Governor Ron DeSantis. Any woman who has an abortion after six weeks and any doctor who gives her care will be guilty of a felony. Abortion after six weeks will be punishable by up to five years in prison. Even though many women don't even know they're pregnant at six weeks. That's not freedom. It's Ron DeSantis's Florida. Campaign for Democracy PAC is responsible for the content of this advertising. No, no candidate. I love the, the disclaimer here. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee, even though who narrated the ad? The, the ad was narrated by Gavin Newsom. Why is he running ads against DeSantis right now? Well, they got this debate coming up. This is the true undercard presidential debate. And they got the debate coming up. And Newsom wants to prime the public to say that he won the debate. He's just trying to get in his opponent's head before the debate. And why did he pick this issue? He picked this issue because he wants to prime a split between the DeSantis and the Trump camps. He wants to rally up the most left-wing base, which supports infanticide. But he also wants to prime this split between the Trump and DeSantis camps because Trump was asked about DeSantis's abortion policy in Florida, and Trump reflexively criticized it. Now, I don't think Trump criticized it because Trump is pro-abortion. I think Trump is the most pro-life president we've ever had in my lifetime, and he's responsible for getting Roe v. Wade overruled after 50 years. But Trump reflexively attacks whatever his opponents do. And so when DeSantis did something very, very good in Florida, which is protect life to a large degree. What was it, a six-week abortion ban? Trump attacks that. He would have attacked anything that DeSantis did, but this puts conservatives in a pickle because it's a, it's a wedge between the Trump and DeSantis camps. Even if everyone agrees on pro-life, it's just another way to get in there. And it's a reminder that Gavin Newsom is a very, very clever politician. He's really smart. In fact, After DeSantis accepted the debate, and it was clear that this was going to go ahead, Newsom mocked DeSantis, and he said, this is a joke. DeSantis is crazy for accepting this debate. 
because it shows that he's not focused. He's supposed to be debating the other Republican presidential candidates. He shouldn't be debating me. Implicit, I think, was that the debate is good for Newsom because it elevates Newsom to the level of a presidential candidate. If Newsom could have debated Trump, I'm sure he would have. Trump's not going to debate anybody. So, okay, he's going to debate DeSantis, next best thing. But then he mocks DeSantis. He says, what is DeSantis debating me for? I'm not even officially running for president. I'm just the governor of California. Guy's totally unprepared. He's just getting in his head ahead of this debate that the point of which I can't even quite understand here. I, I get it for Newsom. And I guess the point for DeSantis is that he wants to be seen as a fighter and he's going to beat up the libs. But I think there are better ways to do that, which actually Vivek Ramaswamy just showed a few days ago. First though, when you want to look good, you got to check out GenuCell. Right now, go to GenuCell.com slash Knowles. I've got a Christmas gift idea that is sure to make you the hero of the season. We all know that the holidays get a little hectic. The shopping, the cooking, the never-ending list of things to do. Well, fear not, because I've discovered a gift that is not just thoughtful, it's downright transformative. That is the gift of GenuCell skincare. From now until Christmas, GenuCell's most popular package has a special discount just for our listeners at GenuCell.com slash Knowles. Treat yourself and your loved ones to the absolute best skincare in the world. Those troubling forehead wrinkles, fine lines, skin redness, and yes, even a sagging jawline will disappear right before your eyes with GenuCell's most popular collection. GenuCell promises immediate effects. You'll see results in less than 12 hours, guaranteed, or your money back. GenuCell made Christmas come early this year. They sent down a ton of products for our office, and everyone looks way hotter now than they did before. Simply the best out there. Go check out GenuCell. You deserve to look and feel your best this season. Go to GenuCell.com slash Knowles to get this incredible Christmas discount. Every order today is instantly upgraded to free express shipping. GenuCell.com slash Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S, today. DeSantis is in a, in a tough spot right now. As I've said from the beginning, I won't belabor the point. He always was in a basically impossible position because the best thing to recommend him is, is the best campaign pitch for DeSantis is that he's the better version of Trump. Bigger, better, faster, stronger. He's more focused, more of a policy wong, whatever. Uh, that argument only works if DeSantis can pull a significant number of Trump voters. So far, he has not been able to do that. So then the second best argument for DeSantis is, well, he's not Donald Trump, so he'll be the alternative to Donald Trump. But the never-Trumpers, some of them like DeSantis, some of them don't like DeSantis because they view DeSantis as a little too Trumpy, a little too willing to, to use government power. So a lot of those people who really want a, a, an alternative to Trump, they're looking at Nikki Haley. They were looking at Tim Scott before Tim Scott dropped out of the race. They're looking at other candidates. So this hurts DeSantis' polling. He's still the number two guy in the race. But right now, even in Florida, University of North Florida poll shows Trump at 60% in Florida. That's DeSantis' state where he's currently governor. He's currently up on DeSantis by 39 points. That puts DeSantis at 21. And DeSantis is still way up on his next nearest opponent, Nikki Haley. But who cares? If you're looking at 60 versus 21 versus 6, it doesn't really matter. DeSantis could have 30 points. It still wouldn't, he would still be way behind Trump. And nobody wants to be number two. The other thing that's going to hurt DeSantis here, again, I hate hate to be the bearer of bad news for, for people who, and I, I really like DeSantis too. I'm not endorsing in the primary, but I really like the guy. I think he would be a, a perfectly good president. I think he's been an excellent governor of Florida. But what you're going to start to see happening is the momentum building. Now that it looks as though DeSantis is not going to go the distance, some people are going to start to look at someone like Haley, but other people who were sitting on the fence are now just going to endorse Trump. So you, you've seen Sarah Sanders, for instance, who obviously she worked for Trump. She's been very supportive of Trump, but she said, I'm not really going to endorse yet. She just endorsed in the primary, endorsed Trump. You're seeing people who had previously endorsed DeSantis in Florida, five of them, Florida uh, representatives, flip and they vote. They, they now endorse Trump. You're seeing now Governor Abbott in, in Texas, who was sitting on the fence. He wasn't going to pick a candidate. He's just come out now. He endorses Trump. We need a president who's going to secure the border. We need a president who's going to restore law and order in the United States of America. Not letting these criminals run ransack over the stores that you see images of almost night nightly. We need a president who's going to restore world peace as opposed to this outbreak of warfare under Joe Biden. 
We need Donald J. Trump back as our president of the United States of America. I'm here today to officially proclaim my endorsement for Donald J. Trump to be president of the United States of America again. There he is. Okay. So you're seeing consolidation. And that will probably continue. I'm not saying DeSantis is out of the race yet, but the question is, what is going to change the momentum here? The answer previously was the debates. Just wait until the debates, and then that's going to change the momentum. Didn't happen. A lot of people were saying Trump should show up to the first debate. You'll recall some of us said that while we might like Trump to show up to the debate, if I were advising the Trump campaign, I would say don't show up to the debate because it can only hurt you. It can't really help you. It's very, very high risk, very little potential reward. Then some people said, okay, he won't show up to the first debate, but he will show up to the second debate. I was skeptical of that too. I said, we'll see if the strategy works. Strategy works, so he doesn't have to show up to any of them. So now the debates aren't going to make a difference. So, so now what's going to change the momentum? Well, for DeSantis, he's got this Hail Mary pass, which is the, the debate with Gavin Newsom. If that debate goes really well, maybe that affects the race. If the debate goes poorly for DeSantis, that might affect the race too, in that it might, it might wrap it up even more quickly. What about the other candidates? Vivek has a different strategy. Vivek is not going out and debating prominent left-wing politicians. Vivek is going out. You want to get back to our Hamas story. You, you want to get back to the real nature of journalism. Vivek is going out and he's attacking the most notable and prominent opposition leaders of all in the United States, namely the left-wing media. That language, they live like vermin. Do you believe that that is, as your uh, Republican colleague, Chris Christie, has said, neo-Nazi rhetoric? This is a classic mainstream media move. Pick some individual phrase of Donald Trump, focus on literally that word without actually interrogating the substance of what's at issue. The word I was chosen for a reason. we are in the reason. middle of a cultural war in this country. The well, you know what? It, it, it's reason. actually describing a series of behaviors. You have Antifa and other related groups that have been burning down cities for the last three years in this country. Would you describe them as vermin? Wildly violating the rule of law. We have an invasion on our southern border. We have millions of people crossing our southern border. Let's talk about the substance okay. of why we have to recognize would, that we're not in ordinary you, times. Would you so use that language The vocabulary of the vermin or not is not what's important. Well, I haven't used that language. So, so you can look you? at my, my track record on the campaign trail. I talk about the issues. We all talk about them differently. But what I'm not going to do is play some game of focusing on some word that somebody else said without ignoring entirely the substance of what we're actually talking about. A border crisis of historic proportion. Economic stagnation we haven't seen in 50 years. A national identity crisis and the loss of national pride in the next generation that's potentially existential for this country. Let's talk about our dependence on China. Today we're actually talking about Xi Jinping, picking on Donald Trump's word vermin to talk about that status quo. You know what's vermin? What's running around San Francisco on a given day before Gavin Newsom cleaned it up on a dime to roll out the red carpet for Xi Jinping. If he could do that for Xi Jinping, he could have done it on an ordinary day. This is a good strategy. This is what we want to see. We want to see our candidates own the libs. Look at Millet down in Argentina. Javier Millet, who is an economist, you know, he, he's a professor. But Javier Millet is also a TV personality. Javier Millet is also a guy with a silly haircut, a guy who dances up on stage. And what does he do? He gives these interviews where he just belligerently attacks the left and people gobble it up. That's what we want to see. And I don't think that's necessarily wrong or base. The libs run the show. They run every institution. They've run them into the ground. They obviously despise us. They express their contempt for us at every turn. And so, yeah, we want to see some conservatives give it right back to them. And what's the most effective way to do that? You could do it by debating the governor of California. It would probably be a pretty good debate. But the way you're, you're most likely going to get that, that, that minute clip that goes viral is in one of these exchanges online. So I think Vivek is very sharp. He's a very strong candidate, especially for having virtually zero name recognition before he entered the race. The question now is, can he close the gap? I, I don't really think there are enough CNN hits in the world for that alone to be what closes the gap. But... It could serve him pretty well in the race, and especially if Trump does end up being the nominee, it could position him well for a cabinet position or, or something else. Or if Trump is out of the race, 
he might even have a shot at the at the title. Meanwhile, Trump says we got to end all this. Trump uh, tweets out, or he doesn't tweet it out. He tr- he truths it out. He says, great polls just released. Best ever, Harvard Harris, Trump, 67%. The Sanctimonious, 9%. Bird Brain, 8%. Is that Haley? <laughs> oh, that's... Sorry, I got, I, I've got. i been a little behind on my Trump nicknames this cycle. Bird Brain means, okay, 8%. Ramaswamy, 5%. Christie, dead in the water, a total loser. Interesting. Ramaswamy and Christie don't, even Christie, who who Trump doesn't seem to like very much, they don't get nicknames, though Though Trump does call Christie a total loser dead in the water. Trump up 7 to 10% on crooked Joe Biden. RNC must save money on lowest ever ratings debates. Use it against the Democrats to stop the steal. If not, revamp the RNC now. That last line is the key here. Because Ronna McDaniel, who runs the Republican National Committee, only has a job today because Donald Trump is willing to allow her to keep that post. Virtually every other candidate is calling for her to step down. And major GOP figures and major conservative movement figures are calling for her to step down. Trump so far has said, well, she can keep her job maybe. But if she doesn't end these debates, maybe we got to revamp the whole thing. And let's say you hate Donald Trump. As you know, I don't hate Donald Trump. I rather like the man. But let's say you just hate the guy, or let's say you don't hate the guy, but you just don't want him to be the nominee again, or however you feel. Can you really disagree with him on this point that the debates serve no other purpose than to waste time and money, resources that could be spent fighting the Democrats? Can you really disagree with that point? You might say, well, the voters have a right to hear the candidates debate. Yeah, maybe. The voters don't seem to care because Trump's refusal to show up has not hurt him in the polls. It's, it, if anything, his polls have gone up. Well, sure, but it's it's disrespectful to the voters. Yeah, again, the voters don't seem to feel that disrespect. They don't seem to care at all. Well, I just think we ought to have more debates. Why? Because that's what we have done in the past. Yeah, in the past, we haven't had primaries like this. This is a totally different primary because for the first time in 100 years, you have a candidate who was the president running for a non-consecutive second term. So it's totally different. You can't say, well, that's what we did in 2008. So what's the point? You might hate him. You might hate Donald Trump for being right about this point. But I don't think that anyone seriously can deny that he is right here. There's no, if the debates were going to change the momentum of the race, wouldn't they have done that in the first three debates? But the momentum of the race has not changed at all in the slightest. Look back at the RCP, Real Clear Politics polling average. So not even just one poll or two polls, but the average of all the polls weighted in a pretty serious way, going back all the way to the very start of this campaign, what was it, 15, 16 months ago? Nothing has changed at all. Candidate goes up a little blip, goes down a little blip. That's about, That's it. So what's the point? And if they don't, cut this out. I mean, I'm not going to go so far as to call for the RNC chairman to step down, but if you're Ron and McDaniel right now, you've got to take this very seriously. I do not blame the RNC chairman for any disappointments that may have occurred in recent election cycles. I think think it's cheap and easy to blame the head of the RNC. I don't think the head of the RNC matters all that much. I think the candidates matter. I think the timing matters. I think the way that the elections are conducted, whether it's hackable electronic voting machines or paper ballots, I think that matters. I don't really think whoever sits as the chairman of the RNC does all that much. But if you're Ron McDaniel and your only prominent defender right now is saying, hey, lady, shape up or you're out, you probably got to take that pretty seriously. So putting aside these elections for a moment, moving on to more consequential matters, the Pentagon is, you want to talk about wasting money on nonsense. The Pentagon is about to finish spending $270 million on DEI initiatives, which we'll get to in one second. First, though, my favorite comment yesterday is from Joshua McAvoy, MK5RR, says, bring Xi Jinping to Philly, man. This place needs some help bad. I totally agree. 
whoever wins the presidential election, whether it's Trump or DeSantis, whether it's Biden or Newsom, whoever wins, that person needs to promise within the first 100 days to bring Xi Jinping on a national tour of the United States. All the major cities, we will clean up these cities for the first time in decades. It'll be really great. Then send Xi Jinping home. I don't want him to stay here too long, but just long enough to clean up all of the cities. That sounds terrific. The best deals of the year are happening right now. And yes, that includes 50% off new Daily Wire Plus annual memberships. But there's so much more to check out during this Black Friday sale. Go to dailywire.com slash Black Friday to check out all of the best deals, including up to 70, 70% off apparel, the famous Leftist Tears Tumblr, books, and much more at the Daily Wire shop. Top it off with a huge deal on the best game to play with your friends and family this holiday season. That is the yes or no game by yours truly. Start filling up your carts before these deals disappear. Shop all of the Black Friday deals right now. Dailywire.com slash Black Friday. Do not miss out on the best deals of the year. The DOD, the, the Department of Defense, is now looking at spending $270 million in taxpayer funds to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion and accessibility. There's a new one. It's DEIA now from fiscal years 2022 to 2024. So you had DEIA spending in fiscal year 2022 was 68 million bucks. Then it jumped to 86 and a half million bucks in 2023. Then it jumped to 114.7 million bucks in the initial request for 2024. So you're looking at 270 million bucks. Why? For what? For what purpose does that serve? It advances political correctness. It advances the liberal agenda. It advances wokeness or whatever word you want to use. It in no way makes our military better able to fight wars. How does diversity help our military fight wars? It doesn't. It doesn't at all. Unity helps militaries fight wars. Diversity does not. Equity? How does equity help? We don't want equity in the military. We want the strongest, baddest, toughest, craziest, most disciplined guys to go out there and kill our enemy. You don't want equity. You don't want a leveling of anything. You want, you want excellence. Inclusion. Inclusion? No, I don't want inclusion in the military. I want exclusion. I want all the people who are weak, all the people who are unsure about our objectives, all the people who are a little lukewarm on patriotism. I want them all out of the military. I don't want inclusion in them. I want severe exclusion because I want the very, very best. Accessibility even. I'm, I'm all for making life easier for people who have diff- particular difficulties in civilian life. Not in the military. I want, I want people who are in the absolute toughest, baddest fighting shape in the military. Listen, I don't, I don't run a four-minute mile, all right? I've never, I've never focused as much as I probably should on physical strength. Okay, I know I look like a hulking, glistening Adonis. It's just how I was born. It's not for any working out. I'm not, I, I probably am not in fighting shape to go fight a war today. That's fine. Okay, if I were drafted, I'd try to, I'd try to make it work. But I'm, I don't think that the military is for everybody. I want the toughest, baddest guys who are going to fulfill the only objective of the military which is to protect us, which entails killing our enemies. <laughs> okay, that's it. 270 million bucks. Not only wasted. The way this is being reported is this money is being wasted. It's not. It's even worse than that. It's money that is being spent to make us weaker. How pathetic is that? Now, speaking of money grabs, Snoop Diggity Doo Dog, as you know, said that he was going to give up smoke. And when this ad came, he posted it to Instagram. He said, hey, I'm giving up smoke. Please respect my privacy, Snoop. And I said, hold up. All the fellows who be saying he's soft, Snoop don't play. He's going to rock it until the wheels fall off. I thought that we might actually be preparing for a new episode. 
So if Snoop was going to give up the Sin Spinach, maybe he'd move on to puffing something else. For those who are listening right now, I am, in fact, tapping the Mayflower box. But it turns out Snoop had another trick up his sleeve. Here it is. I have an announcement. I'm giving up smoke. I know what you're thinking. Snoop, smoke is kind of your whole thing. But I'm done with it. Done with the coughing and my clothes smelling all sticky icky. I'm going smokeless. Solo stove fixed fire. They took out the smoke. Clever. (laughs) Snoop is there. Obviously high. Toasting a marshmallow. It's clever. I loved even the commentary of the ad where he just looks at you and you know, it's so officiously lame that it's actually cool and funny again. He goes, clever. I'm going smokeless for this fire pit that I have outside. That dirty D-O-double-G. He got us again. Now, maybe I should send him a box of Mayflower anyway. You know, maybe it's just an opportunity. Okay. There's a note I wanted to read. Someone wrote in to me. Yesterday, two days ago, a listener wrote in. And some when I talk about dogs, you know I'm not a huge, I'm not, I'm not, it's not that I'm a dog person, it's not that I'm a cat person, I say I'm a people person. And I wrote in, or rather, I I mentioned this story about how pets don't make people happier. There's a study. I think studies are mostly bogus, but when they back up my points, I cite them. And the study said, actually, you think pets are gonna make you happier. They, they really don't. Pet owners and non-pet owners are about equally happy. And I said, this is important because there's no substitute for for humanity. You Maybe you can't have a child. Maybe you're infertile. A lot of people deal with that. It's a very tough thing to deal with. Maybe you're not called to marriage. Maybe you're not called to parenthood. But you should be involved with people. You can be called to a kind of spiritual parenthood, like being your godmother, godfather, maybe you're a priest or uh, otherwise religious. But you need to be involved with people. Dogs aren't going to cut it. And I got this letter. As Michael, I'm a 45-year-old mom of dog that completely agrees with your opinion regarding dog moms. Not dog parents, as the men rarely use the moniker. I fully fell for the lie that as a woman, I could have it all. I graduated college with a BS in nursing and an officer's commission in the U.S. Air Force. Thank you for your service. I had every intention of seeing the world, finding the perfect man, and being able to work full-time while raising my children. But thanks to chick flicks and the feminist worm in my ear, I kept looking for the next best thing and missed what was right in front of me. I fled from a wonderful man who wanted to marry me because I had come to believe I could do better. (laughs) Wrong. I bounced from man to man, always wanting something more. I lost out on my one opportunity to have a family and suffered the pain and loss of having to abort an ectopic pregnancy due to complications associated with endometriosis. Even though it was a non-viable pregnancy, I grieved the loss of that little zygote every day. As a result of my struggles, I became closed off and unable to accept love from men. I remain single to this day. Although I have come to understand my mistakes and accept my culpability, I know I am also a casualty of the leftist feminist ideology. I pray every day for healing and guidance from God, for he is truly the only one who can make me whole and worthy of love. Since I'm single and alone, I've chosen a dog as a companion for now. It was either that or cats, and I refuse to be a cat lady. I also deal with PTS for my military service and was graced with the gift of my Aussie doodle puppy two years ago. While I love him dearly and I'm so grateful to have a watcher while I pee, I do my very best to avoid the dog mom stereotype. I also urge every woman I talk to to avoid my mistakes and accept that having it all is impossible. It's a cruel joke played by the left and perpetuated by Hollywood and the media. It's so important to keep telling women that there is always a sacrifice when we try to have it all. And the real question is, what are we willing to sacrifice? I grew up with a working mom and dad. I can say with no hesitation, I would have preferred my mom was home more. Any child that has a working mom is losing out on a very important bond, and it will shape them in unimaginable ways and forever harm their life. I'm fortunate enough to still have my mom and dad together and in my life, but many adult children don't. It's the truth that the only thing I want from my parents is their time and company. Money is important for survival, but you are so right when you say a childless life is not worth the small increase in income. I'm living proof. I would give up that 8% and more to be able to go back and fix the dumbest mistake of my life. I've tried to be a parental figure by sponsoring a child through Compassion International. I write letters to her and try to be a good influence, but it is a pale imitation of what I should have. I have a 16-year-old nephew who is a budding artist, and I try to nurture his talent, but he lives far away, and it's difficult to communicate with him. I take solace that my nephew is, was, 
was homeschooled by my sister-in-law, and I tell her she's a hero every chance I get. I'm so worried about the future of younger generations and how poorly they've been raised, many of whom have been raised by public school teachers, how warped and poisoned their minds have become. They've become confused about everything and are ripe for the plucking by leftist propaganda and activism. I encourage you to share my story and keep talking about the importance of faith in God, family, children, and committed couples. These are the only things that will save us from the abyss of leftist ideology and agenda. And then she goes on to thank me for the show. Uh, really good letter. Thank you for your letter. Sorry for the difficulties you have faced, but I, I think it was really articulate. And you, you, have, you are giving people the grace of uh, teaching by example of the things you've learned. Really good lesson. Okay, it's Tuesday. We got to get to it. The show continues now. You don't want to miss it. Become a member. Use code Knowles Canada BLS. Check out for two months free on all annual plans.